Hello, you're about to listen to a radio program provided by the Limestone Church of Christ, located in Kingston, Ontario. Please feel free to check us out on the web at lookingunterjesus.net. Hello, and welcome to our program. My name is Tom Rainwater. Keith Sharp and William Stewart have joined us today in our discussion of God's Word. So let's open our Bibles and consider the things that are said in God's Word. The question we're going to discuss today is, what kind of kingdom did Jesus promise to establish? There are many conflicting beliefs in the religious world today about the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Some believe that Jesus has not yet set up his kingdom, while others believe he's already done so. Some think that Jesus' kingdom is physical in nature, much like the kingdoms of the world today, with a physical capital, a physical army, and dominion over physical land. Others say that Jesus' kingdom is spiritual in nature and his dominion is in the hearts of men. And gentlemen, let's deal with the following questions in our discussion today. Number one, what kind of kingdom did Jesus promise to establish? And number two, is his kingdom present or future? And if present, when did it come into existence? Well, let's deal first with the first question that you asked, Tom. What is the nature of the kingdom? Is it spiritual or physical? Perhaps the most influential book that's been written in the last generation on the kingdom was the book by Hal Lindsey entitled The Late Great Planet Earth. In this book, Hal Lindsey made the statement concerning the kingdom that in the kingdom of Christ, you're going to have a chicken in every pot and nobody's going to steal it. And that, by the way, is a quote. And so according to Hal Lindsey, we're going to have a physical kingdom that will provide food in which there will not be any stealing going on. Well, see how the Apostle Paul speaks about the kingdom in Romans chapter 14, verse 17. In Romans 14, verse 17, the Apostle said, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And thus, the kingdom of God does not pertain to the physical blessings, such as uh, nobody's going to steal anything, or uh, that there's going to be food for all, but rather, it pertains to spiritual blessings, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. This indicates that the kingdom of God is spiritual rather than physical in its nature. In John, the 18th chapter, as Jesus is appearing before Pilate in his court, In verse 36, Jesus speaks about his kingdom and speaks of the nature of his kingdom. He says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. And so when we look for the kingdom of God, we must not be looking for a physical kingdom, but something that he says is not of this world, not of an earthly or a physical nature. Another passage that we might consider is in Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. It says, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he, speaking of Christ, answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here, or lo there, or see here, or see there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So the very fact that Jesus says the kingdom of God does not come with observations shows us that it is not physical in nature because you can see when a physical kingdom rises to dominance or or comes. He says the kingdom of God is within you, indicating its spiritual nature. Another principle that would indicate the spiritual nature of the kingdom of God is how one enters the kingdom. To become a citizen of a nation of this earth, the normal way is to be born a citizen, or one can be naturalized and become a citizen of that country. That's how one becomes a citizen of a kingdom of this world, a physical nation. But notice how one becomes a citizen of the kingdom of God. In John chapter 3, let's read verses 3 through 6. John chapter 3, verses 3 through 6. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. To enter the kingdom of God, we must be born again. That's a birth of the Spirit. It involves the Spirit, the Spirit of man. And therefore, we see that the kingdom of God is spiritual, not physical in its nature. You can be physically born a citizen of a nation of this world, whether it's the United States or Canada or any of the nations where one might be born. But to become a citizen of the kingdom of God, you must be born again, born from above, a spiritual birth that involves the spirit of man entering a spiritual kingdom. I'd like to consider what is said in Mark chapter 12, Mark chapter 12 and verses 28 through 34. And I'll go really to the one of the last statements in that context and then back up and read and see what's there. Where Jesus says to one of the scribes, you are not far from the kingdom of God. All right, let's see why Jesus makes that statement. And I think by this passage we can see the nature of the kingdom. We back up to verse 28. Then one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together, perceived that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, with all of your mind and with all of your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God and there is no other but he, and to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And that's when Jesus saw that the scribe answered wisely and said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And so when Jesus says, You're not far from the kingdom he said that because of the statement that the scribe said. Now, by saying not far, he doesn't mean you're not far from the kingdom on the map. He's not saying that you're not far from the kingdom in terms of time. He means you're not far from understanding the kingdom, that it involves the rule of God in the hearts of men. When we have the attitude that we love the Lord God with all of our hearts, mind, soul, and strength, that's when we are closest to the kingdom of God. There are a number of people in the religious world today who would either be called premillennialists or dispensationalists, and they teach that when the Lord came, He intended to set up His kingdom, but because the Jews rejected Him, then He was forced to set up the church as a substitute for the kingdom. They teach that we now live in the church age, and that sometime in the future the Lord's going to establish His kingdom. Which lead us to ask, well, what's the relationship between the church and the kingdom? Well, Keith, I believe that the Lord would equate the church and the kingdom, that he would say that they are one and the same. In Matthew, the 16th chapter, beginning at verse 13, we're told, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now notice in verse 19 he says, And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now Jesus tells us that he is going to build his church. And then in the very next verse he refers to these keys to the kingdom of heaven that would be given to the apostle Peter. Well, I believe that if we go to Acts in the second chapter we find the Apostle Peter using those keys to the kingdom of heaven. 
and that he's opening the door to the kingdom of heaven by his teaching of the gospel there. In Acts, the second chapter, as the Holy Spirit had come upon the apostles, we're told in verse 14 that Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice. We have given to us a sermon preached by the apostle Peter to those who were present at Pentecost. And what we find as being the result of his preaching is that some asked what they should do. They realized that they had put to death the Lord and Savior. And they asked Peter what they should do in verse 37. Peter tells them in verse 38 to repent and to be baptized for the remission of their sins. And as we follow through the text, we find that the Lord then added them to the church. Well, Peter is opening the kingdom. He's opening the church. I believe the Lord and Peter understood those to be one and the same. And so we see by that passage that the kingdom is not something in the future, that it was actually present in the first century. Now, if it was present then and present now, exactly when did it come into existence? Tom, it's interesting that when we read our New Testaments, consistently before Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Before that, the kingdom is spoken of as future. But after Acts chapter 2, the kingdom is spoken of as being in existence. For example, we could go to Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. During the lifetime of Jesus, as Jesus was preaching on this earth, during his earthly ministry, And at that time, the kingdom was in the future. In Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, we read, Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And thus, while Jesus was ministering on this earth, and of course this was at the beginning of his earthly ministry, then the kingdom of God was yet in the future, but it was near. It was at hand. I believe in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, Jesus identifies for us how near or how at hand the kingdom indeed was. Mark 9 and verse 1, we're told, uh, Jesus said to them, Assuredly I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Jesus places the kingdom of God in that very generation, that it would be present, that it would come, that it would be seen by men in that generation. And thus, as we've said, the Apostle Peter opened those doors, and the kingdom was present at that time. In the passage that William just read, it talks about the kingdom coming with power. Well, in Luke chapter 24, we read about something that Jesus said to his apostles after his resurrection from the dead and before his ascension into heaven. He said to them in Luke 24, in verse 46, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem, until you are endued with power from on high. And so there Jesus tells his apostles to wait in Jerusalem until they were endued with the power of the Holy Spirit from on high. And so in Acts chapter 2, we see that this was exactly what happened. That in verse 1, Now when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so there is when the power of the Spirit came upon them from on high. And that was when the kingdom came with power. I'd like you to consider in Acts chapter 1, where it talks about Jesus, after his resurrection, ascending into heaven. In Acts 1 and verse 9, Now when he had spoken these things, that is, to his apostles, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So Jesus ascends to heaven. Well, there's a prophecy in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 7, to show us exactly what happens when Jesus ascends into heaven from the viewpoint of heaven itself. 
In Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13, Daniel says, And I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. So we're talking about a prophecy of Christ. One like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, the Father, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion, and a glory, and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting one, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. But here we see that Christ received the kingdom from the Father after he ascended through the clouds to heaven. The Father gave him that kingdom. And that's exactly the message that Peter preached in Acts chapter 2. Jesus is Lord. In connection with this, our premillennial friends believe that Jesus does not actually rule now as king. They teach that he is king by right, but not in fact, and that he's going to rule sometime in the future. Well, the apostle Peter didn't know that. Go to Acts chapter 2, this transitional passage where we see Peter with the keys of the kingdom, the gospel opening the door to the kingdom. And in Acts chapter 2, notice as Peter speaks of the resurrection of Christ, beginning in verse 29, Men and brethren, let me freely speak to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ, now notice carefully, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus has God raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Peter said, that God raised up Jesus to sit on His throne. Now, we have a, a quandary here. Either Jesus now sits on His throne, or He has not been raised from the dead, because He was raised from the dead to sit on His throne. Those who deny that Jesus now sits on His throne are in effect denying, although they don't recognize this, I'm not charging they believe this, but this is the logical conclusion to the doctrine. In effect, they're charging that Jesus was not raised from the dead. Jesus was raised from the dead to sit on His throne. And that rule, with Jesus ruling and reigning on the throne of God, the throne of David, His own throne, that rule began on the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In fact, Peter states emphatically in verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. The fact that he is referred to as Lord shows that he sits in a position of authority, the authority to give law, to tell us what we must do. Then, of course, Peter told them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins. In Revelation chapter 1, and at verse 9, the Apostle John, as he is writing, says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm curious if the kingdom of God did not exist and does not yet exist, as some will tell us, then how was John a brother and companion of those to whom he wrote in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ? He says to us that he is in the kingdom and that his companions and his brethren are in the kingdom as he writes these things. Paul also makes a similar statement in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. Colossians 1 and verse 13. In writing to the brethren there at Colossae, he says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness 
and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. And so when we obey the gospel, we leave the realm of Satan, the power of darkness, and we enter into the kingdom of the Son of His love, that is the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And so Paul indicates that those brethren were in the kingdom with Him. And so the kingdom was in existence there in the first century, as we've spoken of, and it's in existence now. We just need to meet the conditions for salvation to be entered into that kingdom. Tom, one of the earliest books of the New Testament to be written was the book of 1 Thessalonians. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12, we read that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into His own kingdom and glory. So if you go out to Revelation, which perhaps is the last book of the New Testament to be written, and work our way back toward the day of Pentecost to Colossians, which was written in around 61 or 62 A.D., to 1 Thessalonians, one of the first books of the New Testament to be written, in each case we find that the kingdom of God is already in existence. But if we go back before Pentecost and we begin with the ministry of John and work our way forward, we find that in each case the kingdom has not yet come, but that it is near. And Pentecost stands in the middle as that time when the kingdom of God was established upon this earth, when Jesus began to rule and reign on the throne of God, the throne of David, his own throne. That was the day when that spiritual kingdom, the church, had its beginning. Now that we see that the kingdom is spiritual in nature, and that it began on the day of Pentecost, the first Pentecost after Jesus' resurrection, let's ask this question. How long is the kingdom going to be in existence? How long will Jesus reign? Well, the Apostle Paul very plainly answers that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, let's begin in verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead, and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. That's verses 20 through 26. And thus Jesus began to reign on the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. He will continue his reign until he comes again. Then when he comes again, rather than receiving a kingdom, he will return the kingdom to the Father, that God may be all in all. Gentlemen, our time is up for today. And I want to thank you, Keith and William, for coming and helping us in our Bible study today. Let's summarize what we've learned. Number one, the kingdom that Jesus established is a spiritual one. Jesus said that his kingdom is not of this world, that it is within you. And so Jesus rules in the hearts of men and women when they obey his word. Number two, one becomes a citizen of the kingdom of God through spiritual birth. John 3 and verse 3, Most surely I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In verse 5, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water in the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Number three, the kingdom of Christ is the same as Christ's church. The term kingdom describes the rulership of Christ as king, that he is king over his subjects. The term church identifies the subjects as the assembly of Christians who obey Christ. Number four, The kingdom came into existence with power in Acts chapter 2 on the first Pentecost after Jesus' resurrection. Before then, the kingdom is spoken of as being in the future and at hand or near. In fact, the kingdom came within that generation.
after Pentecost, the kingdom is spoken of as being present. Number five. In Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches Jesus as being risen from the dead to sit on his throne in heaven. Peter said in Acts 2, verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. The term Lord referring to his authority and rulership. Number six, Jesus will reign over his spiritual kingdom until he returns and the dead are raised. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24 through 26 at which time he will deliver the kingdom to his father.